Oh, thank you. And it is really so great to be here with you all, even though it's in this virtual space. And I am really glad to be talking to you all about promoting mental health for black communities, for our communities. If this is something that is very important. I'm sorry, I only have a limited period of time because we could talk about this for a long, long time. But today we're going to um, discuss one, mental health, health disparities, health equity, racism, social and political determinants of health that we have to know about, and then the root causes of health disparities in mental health conditions, and list strategies to promote mental health and well-being for Black communities. So I'm going to start off so we all are in the same place with some definitions. So when I speak of health equity, I am talking about health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of a social position or other socially determined circumstances. When I speak of culture, I'm talking about our shared beliefs, customs, communication, food, rituals, just our, our lifestyle that is consciously and sometimes unconsciously passed across generations of people and populations. So I might mention culture, that's what I mean. Well, people throw this word around poverty. What is poverty? In 2021, the federal government uh, identified poverty for a family of four as being $26,500. So, so think about that. What can you do? This is a family of four that has to eat, clothe themselves, house themselves on $26,500. We in the richest country in the world, we can do better than that. We should not have people living at this just barely subsistence level. So this is something we're going to talk about the political determinants of the social determinants. And then we have adverse childhood experiences. Those are witnessed or experienced events such as poverty, racism, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, community and violence, and caregivers with a history of mental illness, domestic violence, drug dependence, or incarceration. And of these, the most common, about 75% of all types of child abuse is neglect, is neglect. Okay, so we hear a lot about maybe sexual abuse, physical abuse, but 75% of abuse in childhood tends to be around emotional abuse and neglect. When I talk about race, I am talking about a social political construct that's based on physical features. It is not a biological construct between you, me, and the next person of different races. We are 99.9% .9 the same genetically. It is one race, it's a human race. However, it is important because of these social political constructs and the unequal, which I'll tell you about in a minute, allocation of resources. So minority, you will probably not hear me use that word minority unless I'm quoting someone else because no one is minor. So we are fast becoming a majority minority nation. Children entering school now in the United States are more majority minority than they are white. So that term I really am trying not to use. We might say marginalized populations, underrepresented in certain fields, overrepresented in certain health outcomes, but we're going to try to, I am moving away from this term, minority. And then racism. Racism is a system. When I am talking about it, I'm talking about this system of structuring opportunities, resources, and assigning value based on a social interpretation of how one looks, which we call race, but it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and unfairly advantages other individuals and really saps the strength out of the whole society. And when I'm speaking about health disparities, I am talking about a preventable difference in the burden of disease, injury, violence, 
homicide that is preventing those from achieving their optimal health. This is experienced by and large by socially disadvantaged populations. So these are preventable differences, health disparities. And we recently are really coming to the conclusion that racism is a public health crisis. So this was recently a written article by the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, that talked about the impact of racism on children and health and actually gave a lot of recommendations. So you might ask your pediatrician whether they have read this policy statement. Also, if you want to take a deeper dive into the history of racism in the United States and, and, and nationally um, and internationally, I would recommend you read or even listen through Audible to this book called Stamped from the Beginning or The Color of Law. We're going to talk about how the government sometimes has unequally allocated resources and what that has resulted in. And now you will see in, in the literature that I read more and more, we are even closely examining the way we teach medicine, the way we teach our medical students, our psychology students, nursing, and trying to unpack and trying to identify racist practices and really uh, take them and redo, renew, revise these types of policies, teaching, and practices that have um, been taught over the years. So this is just where, you know, in the middle or hopefully coming down on this COVID-19 pandemic. And hopefully all of you all have gotten your vaccination. We're not going to talk a lot about that, but hopefully um, that is something that you and your children from 12 years in age and older, if they can have the Pfizer um, have, have done to keep them safe and healthy. But this just takes a look at the population of individuals in each of these states and the District of Columbia, say the District of Columbia, where I was born. So when I was born in the day, a long time ago, it was a, a majority African-American city. It was a majority black city. That's not no longer the case. It's about um, 45, 47% African-American. Yet the deaths from COVID was 75%. So that is a health disparity because you would expect it to be at the same rate. So this was in 2020. Okay, you'll say, well, Dr. Belcher, now it's 2021. Let's see what you got there. So I'm just showing you the differences here. So here is now we're in May of 2021. We're looking at the Kaiser Family Foundation um, uh, data. The previous slide was from the Pew Foundation. And again, we have the black population, the death rate was 70% in the District of Columbia, where the total population was 45%. So you could see that the predicted death rate much higher than you would expect based on the number of people in the population. If you look at the white population in the District of Columbia in Washington, DC, then you would see that the total population in DC is 37% yet the deaths were lower, 13%. So this is something that it's not because the virus is discriminating. This is because the access to healthcare, the co-occurring, the other types of uh, diseases, infections, illnesses that these populations have differ and the access to care. So this has not changed. So this is something that is important. It is also important in mental health. So I'm going to start out right from the beginning, the fourth slide, and giving you some resources to reduce stress based on COVID-19. Some of this is based on COVID-19, but you can also use this if your child, if you are feeling stress from other reasons, whether it's um, having problems with housing, a job, um, your disagreement with um, your friends, 
things of that nature. There's a lot of stress in society, and particularly during that year, those 15 or 18 months that we have been undergoing the pandemic, it has caused people to be anxious because we thrive by kind of having some predictability. And each day, there seem to be changes in what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to keep ourselves safe. So these are resources right here from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. They are available to you online. I've also made a listing, and I have uh, shared that with the moderator of these resources so you can get them for yourself, read them, understand them. There's um, one here from the American Academy of Pediatrics. There is another from this, the CDC. How do we talk to our children? Because there is a lot going on on TV, on the radio, between our adult conversations that is very frightening and stressful to children. So we want to know how can we protect them? How can we make them resilient? So I'd like to ask you, what is health? So this is the definition that was created by the World Health Organization, a state of complete physical, social, and mental well-being. And when I pose this to our college students, the college students, the graduate students that I work with, they also add spiritual. So a complete state of physical, social, mental, spiritual well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, because we might have to live with a disease like high blood pressure or asthma. So we want to do the best we can. And this diagnosis, or this, I'm sorry, definition of health was from 1948, and it still really holds very much true today. So we want to be in the United States. My dream for the United States is that we're not a sick care society that just deals with sickness, but we are a health and what you all said, well-being. We are a health and well-being society. So how do we get that for the black population and the Latinx population, American, Indian, Alaska Native, some of the Asian populations? We will have to move to equity versus equality. So this is equality. Everybody gets the same thing, no matter what your needs are. And you can see this is a diagram from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that you have this gentleman who's very tall. You have a lady that looks like it's about right for her. And you have this little guy who's trying to, trying to ride on his bicycle. But an equity is those who have need, specialized need, they get what they need. So an equity-based approach is for the resources to be allocated so that those who have differential needs get them, not necessarily more or, or less, but they get what they need. Distribution of resources so that each person gets what they need. So then we want to go from this equality, everybody gets the same thing when we know we all have different needs to justice. So this is equality. Everybody, both the young people, they have a ladder. But what's happening? The tree is turning to, and there's lots more apples on that other side. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, and then here we have a little equity. So he gets a little bit higher ladder and he could pick these three or four apples off. But justice is when you have an equal distribution of resources and each person is able to enjoy from the system. In the United States, we have enough resources to be able to provide justice, not just us. So I say equity until equality. So where does health come from? So when I was a 10 year old and I decided oh, I was gonna be a pediatrician and I was gonna help all young children and families, that's what I was gonna do. And I thought health came from the doctor's office, but really, um, it's the individual's choice, the doctor's office, where we live, work, play, pray, those are things. So from the doctor's office, the nurse practitioner's office, only 20% of what we call health. The large section of health is our social and economic factors, where we live, work, play, pray, 
those are the things, our education, our employment, income, family, community. That's, that is where our health comes from. And it is also determined by policy. So the political determinants of health, the allocation of resources, whether it's the type of insurance we have access or no insurance at all, whether it's the type of foods that we have in our neighborhood, our housing, whether it's safe, our neighborhoods, our educational system. So in the United States, this is from UNICEF, it ranks the top 40 uh, uh, industrialized countries. So where do you think the United States is, the wealthiest country in the world? And this looks at in the first column, no poverty, second column, zero hunger, third column, good health and well-being, quality education, and, and so on. So unfortunately, the United States, in terms of ranking, is very close to the bottom. And that should not be. That should not be. We have to invest in our young people and in our families. So what is mental health? So mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we feel and think and act. It also determines how we'll handle stress. So you remember on that fourth slide, I gave you some resources you can go to and learn about how to help our children, ourselves, to reduce the stress in our life. So mental health is important at every stage from childhood through adulthood. And behavioral health equity, remember I'm talking to you about equity, means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing barriers and obstacles to health, such as poverty, racism, discrimination, and their consequences as far as the educational system, having good jobs, fair pay, safe housing. So we talk about equity means that we have to do something that's much more active in reducing some of the risk factors that prevent us from having health and well-being and enjoying good mental health. So this looks at a continuum of care. That's what we want to think of. I'm a pediatrician. What do we do? We give immunizations a lot. We think about prevention. So that's what we want to go upstream. So I'm going to be talking to you maybe about some disturbing facts that we can do something about. So we want to promote. We want to be on this side of the equation, promoting health. We want it to be universal for all of our children. If we need a specialized care, if we have an at-risk situation where we have parental mental health or incarceration or drug dependence, then our children may need a more selective approach. If they already are having mental health challenges, then they need specifically indicated approaches that uniquely meet their needs. So this goes from universal, more population-based that everybody has access to a more treatment and recovery basis. So why is mental health important? Because we want to realize our full potential. We cannot do it without our mental health. So you notice I'm not talking so much about mental health disorders. I am talking about how can we thrive? How can we do, how can we do the wellness that you talked about for health? So we want to cope with the stresses in life. We want to have a productive work environment. We want to make meaningful contributions. That's what we want to do. So we, um, but there are some disorders which we also know about, and they are behavioral health problems where we have difficulty with drug dependence, drug addiction, serious psychological disturbance, suicide, etc. So these are serious mental illnesses that can really influence the trajectory or the course of our life. So we really do need to identify and be able to access the appropriate care. We need to um, be able to um, have family support services and we need to have physicians, psychologists, social workers, nurse practitioners, nurses, we need to have a healthcare system that is responsive to our needs, to our culture. That's what we do need. So we do need maybe more diversity in our healthcare pr practitioners. So as I um, mentioned to you, the United States makes up 
Um, about 13% um, 13 of the U.S. population is Black or African American, yet there's 16% have a diagnosable mental health disorder. So it's more people than we have combined, like Chicago, Houston, and Philadelphia. So this is something that almost one in five individuals, and when we think of developmental disabilities, it's, it's about the same rate. So um, mental health disorders, and a lot of times we have developmental disabilities, and there might be a mental health disorder such as depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress or schizophrenia. So sometimes they don't come in isolation. So what do we do? The basics of mental health promotion, and that's what we're talking about here today, is how do we connect with others? That's so important to have others that you can trust, that are not abusive, that you can be mentored and coached by. We want to stay positive. It was really difficult last year to stay positive for some families. Sometimes there was loss of loved ones, grief, illness, ongoing illness, um, even more than you would have anticipated with the um, pandemic. There's so much um, loss of life. So it's hard sometimes to stay positive, whether you do that through faith, meditation, exercise, we need to find ways that help us to feel good, to feel positive. Some of that, as I said, is physical activity. Sometimes it is reaching out and helping others be sure to get enough sleep. I need to take some of my own advice here. But getting enough sleep, at least seven to eight hours, really important. Developing coping skills to, to develop our resilience. How can we build on our strengths? I believe the solution to a lot of the challenge is right in the community and sometimes we, we have the strength. We know what works, what doesn't, and often we are not some of the ones who are making some of the policy decisions. So we need to be very active in our policy and who is making our policy at the community, state, local, federal level. And then balancing. Somebody said balancing as far as what is um, your, your health, what is health? It's a balance. Absolutely. Avoiding ac excess. So getting professional help if you need it. And having a good fit be, between yourself, your child, your parent, whoever needs the help, supporting them, you know, connecting with them, getting them, helping them to get the help that they need, and making sure that that healthcare provider is responsive to that child or that person's needs. Very important. So we saw this, and this just came out. Um, Time Magazine, it's okay to not be okay. And Naomi Osaka was able to stand up from, for herself, walk away and say, you know, I am not okay today. I am not, I need to take time for myself. And this we have to do. We have to be able to, to do that, to, to do a self-reflection, to do a self-check and ensure we get the help we need to be the best we can. What I say to a lot of the parents that I work with is to be the best parent possible, you have to be the best person possible. Now, whether that is forgiving yourself for something you have done that was a mistake, or forgiving a parent or someone else for something that they have done to you, how do we become resilient? How do we forgive and move forward and become the best person so we can give the children their their best life because they are the gifts that we give to a future we won't see our children are the gifts we give to a future we may never see and that was um uh representative cummings who i am paraphrasing on that so we have to protect our children we have to give them the resources so they feel that they are lovable and capable. So some of that is, and, and we want to acknowledge that mental illness, attention deficit, learning disabilities, developmental disabilities, sometimes 
there's a stigma and sometimes it's difficult to acknowledge that our children, ourselves, may have a challenge. So the stigma or the denial of challenges may delay getting the help we need. So for instance, when we look at autism spectrum disorder, in the black community, our children are diagnosed later than our white counterparts. It's almost a year to two years later. The earlier you provide the treatment strategies, the more productive the outcomes or the more successful the outcomes. So if you have a question, it's okay to go and get an evaluation. And maybe you might have to have two evaluations if you don't understand and you feel that the provider wasn't hearing you. You want to make sure that the provider sees you and hears what you are saying. And this is the most recent issue of uh, attitude from ADHD, summer 2021. So I'd encourage you to um, read this article. I have the, the uh, magazine right over here on, on the desk, but it's a very good article and I would encourage you to read it. So what are the risk factors with regard to mental illness? So here are some, uh, if we're talking about uh, mental health disorders, we have anxiety, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which you all probably are very familiar with, bipolar depression, depression, and PTSD. So a lot of them, there are a variety of different factors. There's the genetic factors, there are brain structure and function issues, and then there's environmental. So there's not a lot we can do at this current time. Now, if I give this talk in 10 years, there may be some magic that we could do as far as changing the genetics. But most of the time, you have the egg and the sperm that get together, you have the genetics, that's what you have. And there's not a lot we can do um, to ch change that as far as uh, some of these mental health, emotional, behavioral um, illnesses. The brain structure, not a lot we can do there as well. But where we can make a difference is in the environment. So some of these things, um, I, I say that um, fetal alcohol syndrome is one of the leading preventable causes of intellectual disability. It's 100% preventable. If a mother does not drink alcohol, during her pregnancy, she will not have a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. So that's what FAE stands for, the intrauterine drug exposure. And sometimes it's not actually the intrauterine, the actual drug, the cocaine or the heroin, but it is also the environment and these other factors. And I can tell you this, I have been practicing pediatrics for almost 40 years. And when I ask little children, what do they want to be when they grow up? I have never in 40 years had one tell me that I want to be drug dependent or I want to be an alcoholic. It doesn't happen. There are factors within the environment and exposures that oftentimes lead to that direction. Whether it is having a liquor store at each corner in your neighborhood or big billboards that are saying, here, smoke this, this makes you cool, or vape that, or things that are happening within the family environment, or other things that have, have placed individuals at risk. Some of these things are invisible, but they are very detrimental, and they are very harmful to young children and young families. So the environment is where we can make a difference. So this is going back historically. This is a map of Baltimore City, um, which is where I work at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And also, as you heard, on faculty at um, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. But this is from the 1930s. It was actually before my time. And I will tell you this, um, that this is called redlining. You may have heard about it, but that is where actually the government put 
value on certain neighborhoods within the cities, not only Baltimore, but Chicago, Los Angeles, all over. So sometimes it was harder to get loans in certain areas, sometimes easier. The property value was lower in these red zone areas. Um, they had residential segregation in Baltimore so that um, white people and black people couldn't live together. There were restrictive covenants. Even if a black person was a professional and could afford a house on this particular block, if it was a covenant that it was a whites only block, they could not buy in that block. And sometimes in these areas, uh, they would have uh, less resources, the schools would have less resources, the tax base was less. So it made it very challenging after we talk about after slavery, after the centuries of slavery, and then you had a 16 years of some type of reconstruction, everybody said, okay, everything's fine now. And then we have the Jim Crow going back to these old um, strategies where you had this unequal allocation of resources, such that in Baltimore City, there's a 20 year difference in life expectancy. So this is the area down around Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland. They live 20 years less than those folks who are out in, in this area. 20 years, almost a generation less is the mean. And if we look at the average wealth by race, how do families, how were families in the 1960s and 1930s, 1940s, how were they passing along their wealth? They were passing it along with housing, but if you couldn't access the housing, you cannot pass that wealth along. So by and large, wealth was passed by, by the generations of willing properties, uh, land and housing to the next generation, such that now there's a seven to eight times difference in the wealth in a black family as compared to a white family. So the wealth in the white community is an average of 600, 700, almost 700 thousand dollars compared to a hundred thousand in the black community. All things told, cars, um, housing, and everything, seven times the difference in the Latinx community, six times the difference, and a lot of this. This is not because people are lazy or are not smart or don't want to work. This is largely because of structural racism and policies that have allowed this to exist and allowed unequal access to opportunities, education. Education leads to good employment, good employment leads to good health care, and on so on. And it is a snowball effect. But well, I want to um, talk with you about this national study. So this is a study of 58,000 US students, US children across the United States, a representative sample. This is what caregivers say. So in the United States, one and five children are growing up in poverty. We're talking about 20% of the US population is having problems eating finding food to eat, 26,500, one in five children. In Baltimore City, it's one and three. One in three children are living in poverty. That is not acceptable in the United States. And we must do something about that to support changes, an equity-based approach. So this looks at some of the other adverse childhood experiences that I was talking about, 7%. Still, these, these are a large percentages of, of children who are suffering with um, exposure to these things. So this looks at, this is looking at an odds ratio. So this looks at um, black individuals compared to white individuals and other racial groups compared to white individuals. So if you look at hunger, what this means, this darker black line, um, that 1.5, that means that a, a black child, and this is 60,000 children um, that represents the United States, are 50% higher odds of being hungry sometime during their childhood compared to their white counterparts. If your other racial groups, Asian, 
Um, I think they include Latinx uh, in that, although Latinx is an ethnicity and not a race, 20% higher. When you look at divorce, 50% uh, higher in the black uh, community, higher odds. It's actually lower odds for those other groups. Parental death, 2.2, over two times as likely for a child to experience parental death if they're black. And we've been seeing about all of the uh, violence and the homicide that have been happening at the hands of our peace officers and our black men and women in the community. So, so this is important, parental incarceration. So we see all of these racism six times compared to our white counterparts. We see all of this. And I just want to show you, this is kind of what we learn about in medical school and public health. Oh my goodness, that black individuals are more at risk. And so, so that gets into kind of the way we're thinking. But in terms of sheer numbers, we have to be concerned about white children because in terms of sheer numbers, because there are more white children, look at the numbers of white children who have the divorce. Although we saw that the odds were higher, in terms of sheer numbers, parental deaths, look at parental deaths, that's 1,250 compared to 254. The parental incarceration, 2,704 compared to 524. So in terms of sheer numbers, if I see a child coming into my office, I'm not just going to say, oh, because they're African-American, I know they have higher risk that I'm going to expect that they have this, this, and this going on. I look at each child, you have to look at each child individually, because in terms of sheer numbers, it is the white children who have the higher numbers of these types of ACEs. So we have to cut this out for all children. We have to have, we're probably, we're the only industrialized country that doesn't have paid maternity leave after um, a child is born. We, do, we don't have paid support for early childhood services. And what are these ACEs, this adverse childhood experiences? What does that mean in terms of school function? So the more of those ACEs that you have, if you counted them, you know, I listed them off, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, having a parent with incarceration, mental health disorders, poverty, racism. If you add them up, the more you add up, the more likely it's going to be difficult for that child to learn the more they have. So the more likely they have emotional and behavioral, it, it's just like an escalator going all the way up. Behavior problems, they're going to need an IEP or an individual, individualized educational plan, okay? So these are things we can do something about in our households, in our households, in our communities, in our families. So it's really the ACEs, this exposure to all of these different adverse things that we can't see. We just see a little child coming in. We don't know what's happening in the neighborhood as they came to school, in the school, bullying and all of these things. But yet that is the thing that in terms of having difficulty in school, needing an individual educational plan or an individual family service plan, they're 23% higher odds. Sorry, guys, if you're a guy, you have about 87% higher odds of needing educational um, interventions or services. And we know that ADHD occurs a little bit more frequently, autism a little bit more frequently in um, individuals who are born male. Um, when we look at, I'll just show you race, it's actually lower in terms of the IEP are needing the IEP. And I'm hoping that's not because we're ignoring it or we're stigmatizing it. We're just saying work harder. I'm hoping that that is because in reality, um, race is not um, re as related. So, so we have to be careful about that statistic that's saying it's lower, okay? I want to make sure it's lower, not just because, well, we don't want to give the resources to these individuals or we're stigmatizing and so we're denying that it's existing. But poverty also is a, um, is a risk factor here. And children with special health care needs, if we're talking about adverse childhood experiences, they're a much higher uh, percentage. So we have to be very careful about our children. So, so if we have this issues going on with economic hardship, like we were having during the pandemic, even people who were doing well had problems. 
um, the family instability or lack of safety in the community, that dysregulates the way the brain works and leads to problems with nerve development, nerve system development. But we don't have to stop there. There's resiliency, there's strength, there's strength in our families, in our communities. So if we can provide in our homes, safety, stability, nurturance, and stimulation, a secure attachment, our children can do well in school. So we want to make sure our children are ready for school, that they have full tummies, that they're physically ready, they're healthy. Uh, they have, if they have asthma, they have their medication, that they're doing, they're doing what they can. We're doing what we can to promote their health. We're reading to our children every night, reading to them, reading to them, reading to them. Children need to be exposed to 40,000 words a day, millions of words they need for their neurologic system to develop. We have to talk with them, read to them, ask them questions so that they're ready for school and the school has to be ready for them. So that starts in the beginning. As I said, um, in the United States, we don't have um, the same types of services that many of the other countries in Europe have. So when you're talking about building a future, you want to start with a good enriched early childhood. So let's look along the bottom line here. Do you see the United States? No, we do not. Missing countries, the United States, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and we do not have even minimum for all children, minimum early childhood services. And we know we're doing the research, so we know that the Perry Preschool Project, the whole, the high school project works. It, it, it costs on the front end, but it saves so much on the back end because children achieve better in school, they have um, a higher income, they're able to provide for their family. Um, even though it costs a lot, it is our children are worth it. What better way to do that? And I'm gonna tell you this, Canada has nationalized it. They, they have nationalized their this high skip enriched early childhood program. Many countries you see here in South America, in Mexico, in China, they have nationalized these programs. They are investing in their children. Here's another program called the Abecedarian Study. These have our programs, we do the research, we know it, we just need to bring it to scale. We need to have the political will and the moral courage to bring it to scale so we can help our children head start making it more universal building positive school climates, ensuring our teachers are not biased against our children, our, that we are engaged as parents, as, as students in our economic environment. We know that black students uh, have an increased um, suspension rate, even with the same infraction or the same discipline problem, our children tend to be penalized more for that. Our increased rates of suspension lead to dis delinquency, dropouts, juvenile. So we create a, a, a prison industrial complex from our schools to the prisons. They were looking at the rate of third grade literacy in some states like Texas, California to know how many jails they would need to build. We do not want to be a statistic like that. We want to ensure that we're ending the school to prison pipeline. And this was from 2012. They know it exists, they're using it. We have to do something about that. We have to do something to make, to help our children to thrive in the school environment. We have to demand it, it's our taxpayer dollars, and we have to do it in a way that it's a partnership and it's not adversarial. So this is looking at out of school suspensions. It, it looks, although they've decreased, still the African-American are disproportionately represented in that. And we know this is the case. We must do something about it. We must be very involved in this. The, the males looking at our, our males, uh, this is the enrollment, um, but this is for our black students. Here is the school enrollment. This is the number of out of school um, suspension, so it's almost two and a half times that. The same thing for uh, girls. So the, the children with disabilities, the same thing. So for our marginalized populations, the populations that, that are marginalized by the lar larger society, we must be advocates. 
and very effective and strategic in these political determinants. We must understand them and see what we can do to turn this around, to flip it. So wealthier communities are less likely to suspend African-American students than in other schools. So middle schools have the highest percentage of high suspension rates and beginning in middle school, African-American students are more likely than Asian and white to say that the school has treated them unfairly. So we really must get involved. And this is looking at two strategies. Sometimes you have zero tolerance. You have the metal detectors, you know, you have problems going on, the, you have the police in the school system versus more restorative practices where the schools teach or treat the, the young person with uh, respect, try to find out not what is wrong with the person, but what happened to the person not as wrong with Carlos or Jimmy or James or Shakira, but what happened? How can we, how can we take a more restorative approach and all work together? But these are other resources for you to promote mental health. There is uh, called the Steve Fund, which was created actually by uh, uh, parents of an African-American young man who uh, went to an Ivy League school, got a master's degree, was doing well, but then committed suicide. And so they wanted to present, prevent that sorrow from happening to anybody else. So this is particularly for students, college students of color. Um, there's a 24 hour hotline. They also teach students how to be crisis intervention um, counselors. So this, that's the Steve Fund. This is through the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which is funded by SAMHSA. These are reliable federal uh, evidence research-based uh, intervention strategies that are on the NCTSN that you can, you can look for yourself. They're in multiple different languages. They are for teachers, parents, uh, policymakers. Uh, so those are all available to you. These are your taxpayer dollars at work. I encourage you to use them. Again, this is SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. They've added $3 billion. This current administration is adding, understands the importance of mental health, have added through um, some of the new legislation, more funding to help people in taking more equity-based approaches. There's a... Um, website the CDC has on mental health. There's also mentalhealth.gov, another government website um, at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. These are our different mental health services here. There are quite a few of them, very specialized services uh, that you can uh, have resource to. So um, that's the appointment number for those who may be considering for um, children for the Institute. But ultimately, the future uh, will be in your hands. Do you believe that ADHD, ASD, is underdiagnosed in women and non-white people due to a prejudice regarding what they, and this is in air quotes, should be capable of? So um, hmm, that's an interesting question. I, I think that there's probably um, whoever was talking about balance. Um, I, I guess uh, uh, my son, who is a lawyer, he says, uh, there's your side of it, there's this side of it, and then the, the middle is where the truth is. So, so I think that um, sometimes uh, we in the community, particularly in the black community, are very accepting of learning differences. So there may be a delay on the part of parents sometimes to end the denial and the stigma. But then other times there may be that the provider, the health provider may not be listening and hearing and tuning in to what our concerns are. So I, I think it could be on, on both sides. I think we have to be uh, what I call persisters because I'm, I'm a lady. <laughs> so it's a persister, but we have to be per brothers too. We have to, if we are thinking that we have concerns, we have to uh, ensure that our healthcare provider are, 
acknowledges that. If, if the school system is finding that there are difficulties, we have to we have to be able to acknowledge that, and we have to look at a variety of different factors. Um, so I, I think that also, I would say that probably our white counterparts, they have, if you look at the mean incomes, they probably have a higher income level, which comes with more insurance. So we really do need a system, a healthcare, not a sick care system, a system of care so that everybody has equal access. It's not that the wealthiest have the access to these services and those who have kind of, they, they might have private insurance but have these huge deductibles that make you hesitate to even go in because you have to pay $3,000 before you even get anything back. So I think there are a variety of different factors that cause some of these delays or the um, under um, diagnoses. I just, I, I would really like to uh, thank you for, um, for your time and attention. That's really valuable. And um, hopefully I will see you on the street, just say hi. And mm -hmm. hopefully we'll, we'll get um, active and understand more about how we can um, foster a more healthy communities um, to be able to be politically active and to share some of the wisdom that we have from growing up and from the things that we have learned to help our children to do better.